Hello, Penguin Orts, I'm the Billy Penguin, and welcome back to For All Kerbal Kind. We're beginning this episode by finishing our research on supersonic plane development. A little bit later than those Amerikanskis, uh, it turns out that they beat us through the sound barrier by four months! Something Josef Kerman is so pleased about, he gave all of my department heads and their families surprise package holidays to Siberia. But nonetheless, we will be pushing onwards first, though with a brand new rocket. This is the R3 Ballistic, using the RD-101 upgrade for the RD-100 series engine. And this is going to be carrying a little bit of sounding payload, a little bit higher. And since the upgrade gives us a longer rated burn time. We can also stretch the fuel tanks a bit, get a bit more performance out of this. So complete a few contracts, get a bit higher up, you know, just basically pushing the envelope uh, with every new rocket that we design. And of course, we blast it into the sky, still spin stabilized. So this is the last spin stabilized rocket we're going to be launching. And the RD-101 is performing flawlessly. Once again, mostly thanks to uh, all of our extra pre-flight checks. Um, because we are still doing those because our engines are still very unreliable. So it's worth spending another 20 days or so to make sure that they aren't going to explode the second that they leave the pad. So this is an altitude sounding rocket contract. So we have to carry a bunch of sounding payload, which is something that we fitted onto the rocket, up to a specific altitude. And then we get paid a bunch of money from the Soviet Air Force. Who knows what they put in that sounding payload? They just give us an amount of mass and we do it. So, you know, no questions asked unless we want to join those you know said department heads <laughs> over on their uh, package holidays although i'm sure siberia is uh, nice and fun at this time of the year i believe it's uh, near the bear mating season and wolf mating season which makes them notoriously aggressive a reason why uh, soviet spacecraft actually carried small shotguns they had a specific small essentially just like sawn off shotguns specifically designed for space missions in case they landed in Siberia and they had to use them multiple times but anyway with that launch being a complete success we're going to grab ourselves a downrange distance development contract and then we're going to grab ourselves early tracking systems the next technology we have just researched and now we can finally get working on our first supersonic aircraft it's finally time to get ourselves through that sound barrier our sounding rockets from now on are going to be downrange sounding rockets we're going to try and push further and further and gradually uh, get working towards our first orbital rocket although that is still quite a few years away so in the meantime we are going to be launching aircraft as we now have this conical cockpit which has a flight ceiling I believe of 30 kilometers and we can also air launch vehicles now um, we can gradually upgrade our air launch capability uh, but at the moment we will be launching them probably from a Tupolev Tu-4 I said I said that it was a copy of the Russian B-29 in the previous episode and a lot of people picked up on that now, obviously it was uh, it was a one-to-one -one copy pretty much of the American B-29 uh, <laughs> Super Fortress, um, although I believe it had 20 millimeter cannons uh, on the turrets instead of 50 cal turrets so you know perhaps it was even superior in a few different regards i'm sure i'm gonna have some like war thunder player give me an essay in the comments now about all of the improvements they made to it or whatever but uh <laughs> not exactly much of an expert um on those sort of things anyway let's get talking about the actual aircraft we are designing here this is the ha one yes ha is x in the russian alphabet i'm probably butchering that um and i'm sure it doesn't even make any sense because it's not like short for anything I just basically copied X plane and then to put it into the Russian alphabet so it doesn't make any sense but I thought it was interesting uh, and we've called it the javelin because we are quite literally just going to be yeeting this thing into the sky from the wing of a bomber it's essentially just a missile with some wings and a Kerbal strapped to the front of it so uh, yeah one of the more Kerbal things the, the Russians didn't really have an X plane program in the same sense of the you know as the as the US did of course they did test rocket planes but um really not to the same sort of extent uh, although we are going to be doing uh, a pretty comprehensive X plane program in this because well it's a way of getting a lot of science a lot of funds and um, and you can launch them obviously since they are aircraft you don't have to rebuild them every time so we can launch them a lot more regularly so it's going to be a way of getting ourselves some much needed funding for our space program but here we are the 3rd of April and we are launching Alexander Kerman through the sound barrier powered of course by the XLR 11 engine which yes is an American engine but well perhaps some blueprints might have uh, crossed the desk of 
one or two of my spies <laughs> in N9's program. Really what happened is uh, there was no equivalent rocket engine in the Soviet tech tree, right? Um, and it would have given N9 a really unfair advantage if he could use the XLR11 and I couldn't. So uh, we have replicated it. I mean, it's not entirely out of the realm of possibility. After all, we have launched this thing from the wing of a Soviet copy of the B-29. So yeah, it's not out of out of the realm of possibility that we might also copy some of their rocket engines, but we blast ourselves straight through the sound barrier, and since, of course, we were air-launched, we can get quite a bit more performance out of the aircraft than N9 managed to get, well, in his first episode <laughs> with his KLX-1, um, because he didn't even wait to air-launch his aircraft. He just wanted to get it through the sound barrier before the end of the year, so he could beat us, and uh, turns out, yeah, he beat us by quite a considerable margin. Unfortunately, though, uh, I didn't check the altitude ceiling of this cockpit, and it turns out, yeah, it's 30 kilometers, and I blasted us up to 32 kilometers, and we are now out of fuel. So I needed <laughs> to get this aircraft back down below 30 kilometers before Alexander suffocated. You can see the meter in the bottom right. It got really, really close to Alexander suffocating here. I <laughs> whacked the control surfaces as far down as I could. I deployed the flaps and everything. We just about managed to get below uh, 30 kilometers before Alexander suffocated. So um, a little bit, a little bit of a shaky first flight, but thankfully he did not lose his life. And we get all sorts of contracts. We get all of our sound barrier contracts. We get all of our speed records, crude, and of course we even get crude altitude records as well. So we get the 30 kilometer altitude record. Um, so I guess it was it was worth him suffocating for about a minute or so uh, because, well, we got ourselves some prestige, got ourselves a bit more funding. Which, of course, that's what the name of the game is. Our value of human life is a little bit lower in the Soviet Union because, well, uh, we can cover up any failures that we have because, of course, we don't live in a free state. We're actually parachuting down to the surface because, uh, well, although the value of human life is pretty low, it's not that low that <laughs> I want to risk landing this thing on bumpy terrain. That's the problem with air launches is that you tend to end up pretty damn far away from the runway, so I wasn't quite able to glide back. So we just have an emergency parachute allowing us to land. We're then going to grab ourselves an experimental rocket planes contract, and we are now going to launch Nina Kerman through the sound barrier. Not going to be the first woman through the sound barrier either. Um, Eileen Kerman, I believe, did this in January. So once again, um, might have had a few of my department heads <laughs> given given some more package holidays, you know, ah, they're, they're all taking leave at the moment. It's, uh, it really is, um, very generous of our, our glorious leader, Joseph Kerman, to, uh, to look after them in such a way. But anyway, we're going to be a little more careful this time and not actually breach the 30 kilometer mark, but we are still going to try and push a few more speed records and of course get ourselves another contract. But we are just going to start blasting through all of these X-plane, or should I say car? car? I think it's car. Let's pronounce like that, not like, not car. Um, I can't speak Russian. I did actually have one or two subscribers who can actually speak Russian volunteer to give me you know mission names and things but I would I would just butcher them so <laughs> I'm not even going to try but another successful flight of the Ha one I'm sure a lot of you are judging me for not trying to land this thing on on a runway but yeah I mean my landings are poor enough at the best of times uh, <laughs> let alone trying to land them on bumpy terrain um, at about 100 meters per second but this time we are launching Vladimir Kerman and we're launching him out over the Caspian Sea because I thought, well, we can air launch up to a thousand kilometers from the space center. So we might as well pick up as much biome specific science as we can get. So we're going to be air launching over all sorts of different biomes. We're going to be launching to the north, to the south, to the east. And this, of course, is a launch to the west, although I didn't quite launch it uh, far enough. So we end up ditching into the ocean. Um, yeah, I hope Vladimir can swim because, well, he's going to have to tread water in this rather chilly sea uh, before any of our recovery craft get to him. Maybe we should, you know, build in a Kranoplan, a Caspian sea monster of sorts to go uh, rescue any of our <laughs> test pilots that end up in the Caspian Sea. Not technically even a sea, it's technically a giant lake, um, but it got named a sea before anyone knew that, so... Alas, anyway, we have finally unlocked the early rocketry tech node, which gives us access to the RD-102 and the XLR-11 RM-5 upgrade to the XLR-11 engine, which we aren't actually applying on this flight. Um, this is actually 
Um, I'm pretty sure exactly the same uh, engine that we've been using previously. And I probably should have applied that upgrade because it increases the rated burn time of the engine. Um, it turns out here, with the amount of fuel we have, we go one and a half seconds over our rated burn time and the engine explodes. Um, yeah, Raphael Kerman, I, th I think he had, yeah, a second of fuel left and the engine exploded. Uh, so it turns out that putting a new engine onto this aircraft would take 80 days and also delay production of our Ha 2, which we are producing with the upgraded XLR 11 engine. So you know what, we're just going to scrap the aircraft and put all of our efforts into the Ha 2 instead of rebuilding it. So we're just going to scrap it essentially, but we still managed to complete our contract, get a bit more science, and we are continuing to research our technology. We next get the avionics prototype. Um, tech and then we get supersonic flight which gives us an upgrade to our cockpit allowing us to go up to 75 kilometers in altitude and an upgraded air launch capability but in the meantime while we're working on the car 2 we are going to build a new rocket this is the r4 envoy it's called the Envoy because it will be our Envoy to the stars. We will be launching life forms for the first time. And as such, we're not going to be spin stabilizing the rocket because, well, it's hard to monitor the effects of microgravity on living organisms if they are a fine red smear around the outside of the <laughs> biological sample capsule. It's only a small capsule, though. It doesn't contain a dog or anything. It's just a few fruit flies and maybe a mouse or two. But they will be the first life forms to cross the common line. And the first life forms to cross the common line will be communists. They may not be Kerbals, but they will be from Mother Russia. So I think that's a fairly major milestone, a fairly, uh, fairly prestigious thing. Yosef Kerman, please... Uh, <laughs> Please don't send me to join my department heads, thank you. Anyway, so we're also going to whack on uh, some sounding payload because we don't actually have a contract to launch this biological payload just yet, uh, but we might as well complete a contract while we're doing it as well as getting our science. So launching into the sky using full control avionics. You can see it's a pretty massive control module. I sort of whacked it in the middle of the rocket. Um, so it's it's a pretty hefty mass. You can see why uh, I've been using spin stabilization when I can. The second reason for actually using full control is because we need to complete a downrange distance uh, contract. That's what we actually have the sounding rocket uh, payload for. And for that, we need to do a slight gravity turn. I'm sure if we did have it spin stabilized, we could have angled the rocket uh, at launch. But uh, it's much easier just to have full control and launch it this way. So I think from now on, we'll pretty much entirely be using fully controlled rockets, at least for the launch stages. Upper stages will probably still be spin stabilized because avionics, as I said, are still <laughs> very, very heavy and crude things. But once we've got out into space, we decouple the sample capsule and we now return it back to the planet. Uh, we don't actually need a heat shield for something this small. It decelerates really, really quickly. Um, I did say we weren't going to smear the life forms around the inside. And I think we went through about 25 Gs of deceleration there. So, you know, they, they won't be smeared around the outside, at least. They'll be smeared against the end of the container. So I would consider that a win. And you see, we just deploy the parachute and gently return these little mice and fruit flies to the surface. Alive or not, they were the first life forms in space, so I'm going to take that as a win. So we're going to use that science that we gained from that mission and get working on satellite error electronics research as well as spending some of the funds to upgrade our space center. We're then going to begin researching orbital rocketry. So now we've unlocked all of the tech nodes we need to work on orbital rocketry, although they're not going to be researched for quite some time. And then grabbing ourselves a low space film return contract and a downrange milestone for 3,000 kilometers. Now, we're not actually going to go for the 3,000 kilometer uh, downrange milestone in this episode. We're going to be doing that in 1953, and this episode is just 1952. Um, but it has a large advance payment, so we might as well grab it and just use that money to uh, speed up our R&D, speed up our uh, VAB. We've been investing our upgrade points pretty evenly between the vehicle assembly building and the R&D center. And that seems to be working relatively well for us. The pace of our development is keeping, so yeah, keeping neck and neck with uh, the rate that we're building our new rockets. So 
it's quite a nice uh, sort of balance we've got going. The reason why N9 managed to get through the sound barrier first is just because he put pretty much all of his early upgrade points into the space plane hangar, uh, whereas I've been investing in the vehicle assembly building. But as you can see here, we have another rocket. This is the R5 Snaps, and it is going to be returning our film from space. So it's a larger payload and it actually has a payload fairing, and we are launching those biological payloads up as well, just underneath that parachute there. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, I decided to forgo the pre-flight checks on this one and paid the price. This is the first launch of the RD-102 engine and yeah, uh, we had a transient failure about 10 seconds into launch and it fell back onto the launch pad. First major launch failure. Uh, thankfully though, we've got a lot of tech to be researching so it doesn't set us back too much and we will build another one to be launched in the next episode. So. While we're waiting for that to be constructed and for the launch pad to be repaired, after all, a rocket did just drop onto it, we are going to construct the Ha 2, which actually, well, has been being constructed ever since we got the XLR 11 engine upgrade. So, as you see, it's a little bit larger because the main sort of advantage of the upgraded engine is its much longer rated burn time. You saw earlier in the episode what can happen if you even go slightly over the rated burn time. It essentially just increases the chance of something exploding catastrophically. If, you are, if you're under the rated burn time, in my experience, things don't explode, they will just shut down. Uh, but if you take it over that, then, well, yeah, you might have some expensive fireworks on your hands. You see here, though, we are actually uh, making use of those conformal decals, although they're a little glitchy when applied to procedural wings, so uh, unfortunately they don't quite show up. But we have the little two, which I kind of liked. And we actually strap a early film camera onto this, because I thought at the last minute before I launched it, I thought, actually, you know what, we might as well slap one of these on. Because if we, oh, I don't know, stray into enemy airspace we might as well just uh, take a few snaps while we're at it I mean <laughs> what it actually is is I thought we might as well um, get biome science while we're doing this because of course we're returning these um, aircraft anyway right and the early film cameras the science has to be returned so if we're gonna be flying over loads of different biomes we might as well get our film camera science as well it's definitely not because this aircraft is doubling as a spy plane Definitely not. Anyway, uh, this first flight isn't exactly flawless. Uh, we have a few stability problems once we get to high altitudes. I think some of our later hard planes will definitely need reaction control systems, especially if they keep going higher and higher. But even though we don't get to the 45 kilometer mark, which is what's required for our X planes high contract, we do get a 900 meters per second crewed speed record. So this mission isn't entirely bust. And of course, we learned that the aircraft, well, isn't particularly stable at high altitudes. And and velocity so we will be tweaking the wings a little bit before the next launch in the next episode which will be the beginning of 1953 some people got confused by me saying episodes will be coming out every fortnight apparently that's only a british saying it means 14 nights two weeks every sunday uh, every other week you've got my episode and n9's episode to look forward to which of course will be linked in the end screen thank you for watching everyone i've been the beardy penguin and i'll see you all next time